Okay, we're going to get started. If everybody can take their seat. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. I hope you're enjoying the beautiful bird song we have playing here, thanks to Spotify. So uh, I'm going to turn that off so we can use it while we're uh, speaking. <clears throat> Well, there we go. So my name is Tom Kerr. I'm the a part of the Eco Action team here at St. John's, and uh, many of our fellow members are here as well. A lot of us wearing green today. We welcome you to this session. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we the Eco Action team's been at St. John's for several years. Uh, we've done a few. Um, uh, Earth Day fairs a few years ago where we brought in local merchants and uh, county uh, services and NGOs to talk about what you can do to live more lightly on the earth. Uh, and we've also been more recently, if you've been to any of the church events, we've had some really good success with re getting rid of disposable plates and plastics and cups and actually washing the dishes instead. And because, uh, and a round of applause for that, that's a great, uh, great initiative. Uh, and we're going to make this part of all the future St. John's events. And so those are all been great successes. But I have to say, um, I've worked in this space for you know, almost 30 years, but, uh, and a lot of us have, but I think all of us are feeling the climate crisis stronger than ever. And I think we, we thought this year it was time to step up our game a bit more uh, and really think through what we can do collectively about climate change and about our impact. And uh, so we came up with an idea of pledging during Lent to individually take action in our own lives. A lot of times I think we feel a little despair. You, you know, we're seeing in the headlines uh, the stories about the Australian wildfires and you see the, you know, the, the um, wildlife that's being injured and you feel very sad you know, personally and spiritually about that. Uh, you read about, I work uh, in an international organization and I see a lot in Africa, a lot of the, the farmers are without uh, you know, sustenance because they're, they're having droughts and, and floods in their land. And you really feel a sort of a sense of like, oh my God, this is getting to be overwhelming. And I think what we thought, okay, let's flip that around because there's actually a lot we can do collectively together about the problem and give us back some hope. And so if you were here two weeks ago, Sari had a terrific sermon uh, that kind of hit on this and he really hit on the scripture. So a couple of the things he pointed out were, one is that you know, all of our actions have an impact, a larger impact on the world. And so to be cognizant of that and to be thinking about how um, you know, we're, we're all part of a collective whole, and then secondly, to be more conscious in consumption and, and generally think about waste and, and, and what you're doing and what, that, what implications that has in the rest of the world. Uh, and so what we're going to do is go through a little bit of uh, the climate change situation we're at now. And then we have a, a set, series of pledges that you can all take. And hopefully you've seen these great uh, signs that Jay came up with from our, our team uh, with uh, John Muir and Rachel Carson and other uh, luminaries in the environmental movement. Um, we want you to join us. We want you to, th to take a, a pledge in your daily life to, to be part of this solution. And so we want to instill hope. So first, I think just to get us started, we're, in, we're sort of in this uh, unprecedented experiment with the Earth's atmosphere. This is from our friends at, at, at NOAA. The, this is the National Center for Oceanic uh, Administration, which is you know, NASA uh, and uh, working to get us on, on the moon. So they have been tracking uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And you can see it's been back and forth, back and forth for several years until just about 50 years ago and we just spiked up and we just keep going up. And so we don't know what that means. And I think that, that's, the, that's the biggest danger of all this is that they're tracking CO2 levels in the atmosphere and we're just keep going up. Uh, it's actually over 500 parts per million right now. So what does that mean? And, and it's corresponding with, you normally have a, a cycle of the Earth going back and forth on temperatures and going up and down, but then also you can see in the, during the Industrial Revolution, we have started this upward trend that just keeps going up as well. And I mean, all of us have seen, uh, you know, you read the paper, uh, record setting heat in 2018. And then they say in 2019, record setting heat in the last decade. You know, you, you, every year we're setting new records. And it's just, again, it gets you to, you know, clearly we're on a path uh, that's, that's uh, uh, not going to be sustainable. And I think the other point is we have achieved scientific consensus on this. It's really not a matter of belief or, or, or creed. It's uh, all the scientists are pointing to the fact that human caused emissions are causing this problem. I think the challenge is, uh, how, what is how quickly is it coming and what are the impacts and what are the solutions? And that's really where we need to get into the, the discussion around. And so the, you know, the, the consensus is there. And then I think we need to act now. So I think this is, you know, right now we're at 2020, uh, 20, uh, 20, and you can see our current pathway just continues to, we see emissions going up and up and up, and projections on, on temperature going, you know, almost to four or five degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit by the end of the century, which, you know, devastating impacts on floods and droughts and fires and things like that. 
Uh, and so we need to make decisions today to sort of flatten out. And, and we actually, there's a great book that um, we pulled a lot of the solutions pro, from called Drawdown. We need to draw down CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we need to peak, and then we need to start to produce. And by doing that, we, can, we have a hope of stabilizing the climate. We already have some warming locked in, but we can stabilize the climate at relatively livable levels, and then we can, we can get to that point. So that's really what we need to do to act now. So I think for all of us, most of us know, I think the one challenge too, uh, working in the environmental field, you know, we used to think, okay, it's an environmental problem. It's like you, know, you have the end of uh, pollution at the end of a tailpipe coming out of a factory. We can regulate that at the factory level and we're fine. With CO2 it's, and, and other greenhouse gases, it's much different. They're really associated with everything we do. Every, you know, energy in your houses, uh, transport to, to work or to school, um, when you buy products, it's made in a factory that has emissions. Uh, agriculture, when you buy food, there's emissions associated with that. And so everything we do is associated with greenhouse gases. So it's a much different story than targeting one pollutant and trying to reduce it. So that's what's made it so challenging. But the good news, though, is that each of these areas also has very good solutions. And then I think I'll say as well, I mean, I mentioned the wildfires in, in Australia, um, you know, and I think it gets to, for me, a spiritual element when you see things like the coral reefs being bleached because the oceans are getting more acidic, you, see, you really feel a loss there. You, you, there's, there's species that are not going to be living there as a result of our actions. Or, you know, places far, far away we don't see every day, uh, like on the North Pole where the, you know, the, the foraging uh, space for the animals is getting smaller and smaller because the ice is melting. And then you see, of course, then right in our backyard, we've seen the hurricanes in, in Houston and Hurricane Katrina. We've seen um, Hurricane Sandy a couple years back in New York. I mean, these were devastating and unprecedented. And the other point I meant to make as well that I think Sari did a great job of highlighting at his sermon was this sort of justice element of this is that, you know, those are the poorest in the face of the storms that, you know, on the coast are the ones that are least able to bear. Uh, they've contributed the least to the problem, but they're actually the ones that are, are right in the front lines of trying to of achieving the, the impacts. And so um, we are seeing all of these every day. And there's no doubt about that. And so it does cause uh, for alarm. So um, I think the final point is then, I, I think as well I mentioned, a spiritual element is you, is you look at many species are, they predict there, there's, you know, if you've heard of the, the concept of the sixth extinction we're about on the brink of, where this is all, this is the first time an extinction has been caused by man. Uh, and we're at the brink of that right now. And some projections are that two-thirds of all wildlife, you know, plants and animals, uh, are, are on the, you know, in, in the threat area for the next 50 years. And so this, again, uh, is something that's driving us all to, to be you know, concerned and also driving us to action. So then where does that bring us? I think then coming back to the church, we, we looked at, you know, the, our Episcopal Church uh, has been very strong on the issue of climate change and caring for creation. Um, about renewing the earth and thinking about this as they call it our island home. Um, we need, I think it's great to see this sort of spelled out. One is, is about communicating. Uh, it's about doing things like this today and telling each other how much we appreciate nature and how nature makes us feel very good. And it's, a, it's not, we're part of nature and we shouldn't separate ourselves from that and tell stories about that and celebrate nature. I think that's a key part uh, of the solution. I think, as I just mentioned about the justice, we need to really reach out to those that are right on the front lines of, of the impacts of pollution and climate change and help them. And then I think we also need, the final point is then, again, getting to the pledge we're, we're talking about this week, is we need to change our habits and choices in order to live more gently on the earth. And so this is directly in line with what the church has been, uh, has been asking for. So a climate of hope. So I think this is where we get back to our pledge. So then to launch into the discussion of what we decided to do. So uh, we came up with uh, uh, the idea of making these pledges. And I think I just the, I wanted to focus on the word hope there for a second, because I think it's really an interesting philosophical or spiritual thing to think about. First is we don't really, I thought this quote was very good. We don't know what's going to happen or how or when. And that very uncertainty is a space of hope. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, is a, she's written a lot about uh, wilderness in the West. Um, secondly, we've heard uh, Greta Thunberg, if you've been following the climate change uh, activism, has been very, a very strong voice, a teenager from Sweden. You can't just sit around waiting for hope to come. You don't seem to understand that hope is something you have to earn. And then I think the, then it gets to the point of psychologists believe that hope emerges out of two elements, personally determined goals and pathways to reach them. So it's having some agency, setting yourself a goal, and then saying, actually, I, I can reach that. And that's empowering. It can be a driving force, but it has to come from within. It can't, someone can't tell you uh, to have hope. And then finally, again, bringing us back to what we're, we're trying to do here is 
Engaging with like-minded groups with a common goal is one way to bring collective hope. So that's why we wanted to call it a climate of hope. We want to give people the inspiration that we can do this together and we can tackle this together. Uh, and so what we've decided to do, and then again, based on this book, uh, the Drawdown book, and this many other uh, studies that's, that kind of synthesize all the different things that we can do, uh, I encourage you to get it. I just bought it uh, yesterday at uh, Politics and Prose. It's a great, uh, a great read. Um, there are you know, hundreds of actions we can take, but we, did, we chose four. Um, so we're going to talk about home energy and water use. We're going to talk about transport. We're going to talk about food you, choices you make every day, and then about consumption, mindful consumption. So those are the four buckets. Uh, and so what we hope you will do, and I hope some of us have already done it. You can see out there there's a, a pledge box. There's, you can rip up, write in your, your pledge for the, the, during Lent, put your name down, and then we'll, uh, I'll t we'll tell you a little bit more later about how we're going to create a community around that. So the first uh, action is home energy and water use. And so this is an area, if you look at the statistics, um, home energy use is about 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. And water-related energy use is about, so just getting water to our home and treating it causes about, I guess, what is it, 13% of electricity production. And so the, the good news there, though, is, and, and we've been working in this for many years, is that there's a lot of things you can do in your house that actually save you money at the same time of saving the planet. So I think it's a win-win uh, situation to you know, swap out old light bulbs and old appliances that are not efficient, um, to be more smart about how you, where you set your thermostat, to use programmable or, or just set it to be, to be mindful, uh, and things like that in the energy efficiency space. But then also going renewable, um, you, uh, some of us have already put solar panels in our houses or purchased green electricity from your provider. Uh, those are options that we can help you with if you, if you want some more information about. Uh, and then finally, water. I think uh, there's a lot of water use in, in the laundry and in showers, and, and there's very easy solutions. There's a water sense label that the EPA has come up with. Again, there's, there's tips and tools you can use there. So I'm, I'm taking the lead on this one, so I'm happy I'm going to be, we're going to set up, we have four tables around the, the, the place here with, uh, with each of the stations. So afterwards, we can then um, answer questions you might have if you want to take that pledge. Um, so uh, I wanted to stop there for one second and invite Tim Dobbin, who is our, uh, our, our guru of the property space, taking uh, care of our church. Because the good news is if you look up and look all around you, we've been doing great things with the church already in energy. And I, asked, I just wanted him to give you a little inspiration that we've had, you know, you can actually do this, uh, but also tell us if there's been challenges or, you know, things that might translate if you're in your, your home setting, Absolutely. how you might do that. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been a champion of energy efficient lighting here and at home for about six years. The technology's really come along. I'm going to touch on a couple of things you can do to make sure you're pleased with the results because if you choose right, energy efficient lighting, it, you shouldn't notice it, that it's any different from what you enjoy now. Um, but one of our biggest successes is right here in this room. Every, each bulb in the ceiling used to be a 200 watt incandescent bulb and by removing uh, a reflective baffle that was actually hindering the light and putting a three dollar 100 watt equivalent LED that uses just 15 watts, it now costs us about forty dollars a year to light this room versus four hundred dollars previously. And that's been going on for six years, so th they're real savings. Um, I know everyone wasn't a fan of these lights when they initially went in, but again, they're LEDs and they're robust enough that when the school has sort of indoor play here in the rain, they don't get damaged. Um, anyway, what else was there? Yeah, selecting LED lights. If you like the warm, slightly amber glow of your current incandescence, look for labels that say things like warm white or soft white. Another even more accurate way is to get deeper into the label and look at the color temp, which is expressed in degrees Kelvin. So 2800 to 3000 is about right for incandescent equivalents. 4000 is probably more like what you're used to with a fluorescent light. When you get up to 5,000 in the north, that's going to be surgically bright. I mean, it's going to look sort of blue, and you're probably not going to be happy. And I think sometimes when people say, oh, I don't like the look of you know LEDs and things, that's what's going on. They've chosen the wrong bulb for the situation. 
um, on dimming uh, LEDs. They work very well, I think, down to about 50%. But if you have an application where you really like to dim all the way down to you know an almost red look in the room, you're probably not going to be happy. But if you in our dining room, we have these sort of amber shades hanging over the dining room table. The dimming actually works pretty well there because you don't see the ghostly sort of glow of an LED on its lowest dimming capacity. The, the, the sort of light temperature stays the same but you, with an LED, but it just goes down to this extremely faint ghostly glow. And that's probably the main reason we would never go to LEDs in our worship space. Because, you know, Christmas Eve, we like to take the lights down low for Silent Night. It's not going to be a good look. Plus, those lights are only on a few hours a week. It's not cost efficient to replace them. And that's the other thing I wanted to touch on. Where you replace lights, go for things where the light is on all the time. Do you have a porch light? you leave on every night for security. Absolutely put an LED in there. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is uh, this can all lead to a sort of virtuous cycle. I've been so happy with uh, the savings I've achieved at home. I thought, well, yeah, why not use that amount to uh, just buy 100% renewables. Um, and I'm hoping maybe St John's will get to that place too. There's an, been an exciting development where the Eco Action Team secured a grant from the Norwood Parish Fund to retrofit all the classrooms with these um, LED fluorescent tubes like this one. And it used to be that these replacements were dimmer than fluorescence and really were not going to be acceptable to the classroom situation. Now they're just as bright as a brand new fluorescent and they use 60% less energy. And if you can imagine that those classroom lights are on eight hours a day, these are probably going to pay for themselves within two months just as these lights did. And we haven't replaced a, a single one of these in six years. That's the other thing. They're cheap enough now, the smaller bulbs, that you will get the payback within months and they're going to last longer. You're not going to be climbing ladders as often, et cetera, et cetera. So feel free to um, approach me any time about this subject. I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tim. That's great. Uh, so perfect example of, of an inspiration and I, I love the, the story about saving money and then going to the next level and thinking what about buying 100% renewable so that's uh, that's exactly the kind of spirit we're thinking about with the eco uh, action team and these pledges is that you know a lot of us are already doing a lot but there's a little bit more we can probably do uh, and so I will end unless there's question other questions about this topic we're gonna go to the other pledges um, other than if anybody wants to raise their hand and say they're gonna be pledging I'm, I'm gonna be pledging in this area so all right, we've got some pledges. So fill out those forms. Uh, they're out there in the, the, uh, the foyer. Okay, so the next action, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Jay. Oh, yes, please. Do you get credit if you've already done something? Sure, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> so that's the thing is you have to scour which ones haven't you done. <laughs> exactly. No, that's great. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so Home Depot, and then we also will be, I have a list of some resources, the web, web uh, resources you can look up as well if you're looking for, you know, places to shop and all that. IKEA does, okay, good, good tip, see, the motion detector, yeah. Great, other questions on energy, water? Okay, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, food. Uh, okay, good. Yes, it is. Um, good morning, everybody. So nice to see everybody this morning. I get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, food, food and climate change, and I bring good news. Um, food and climate change, what's that about? As it turns out, the food we eat, 
uh, we being the 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet, is responsible for about a quarter of greenhouse gas warming. So it's a huge chunk. The good news is that it's something that we have a lot of control over, especially if we live in an area like Montgomery County, where we have a lot of choices. You know, you, you look at the paper in the morning and there's all these big bad things going on, Australian wildfires or Iowa caucuses, and there's nothing we can do. <laughs> Sorry. And there's nothing you can do about it. But this is something where you, you do have ultimate control. You have agency. Um, you're not controlled by uh, oil company lobbyists or government regulations or the NRA. You get to make the choice. So let me give the three possibilities from our pledges quickly. Uh, one is if, if you eat a lot of red meat, we, we have really good news because you can make a huge difference. Uh, someone who regularly has beef or lamb, red meat, and for our pledges gives it up one, one day a week through Lent, Every, every brick, and goes to just chicken, not a huge change. Every time you do that, you're saving, I think it's 22 kilograms of greenhouse gases, that's CO2 or the equivalent. That's huge, that's like driving 54 miles that you're not doing by not having steak tonight or hamburger and going for chicken, on, on average, and that's on average driving. Um, some people here have already done that and are like chicken or less, so if one day a week you can go to um, a strictly vegan meal, that means also no cheese, no dairy, um, you're still saving 2.8 kilograms, that's about six, six pounds of greenhouse gases, uh, the equivalent of driving seven miles. Again, that's a pretty, pretty big deal. And we certainly have some difficult people here who are already like strictly vegan, no cheese, dairy, meat, or anything. For you difficult people, I'm, <laughs> I'm cutting into one of the other sections, uh, if, you, if one grocery trip a week you don't drive yourself, but walk, bike, bus, uh, scooter, I've got, done grocery shopping by scooter, um, carpool, uh, you save 0 0.404 kilograms of greenhouse gases uh, for every mile that you don't drive, so you can pledge to make a difference that way. Um, there's a bunch of questions to go with this. We have resources over there. Uh, I also, since Paul today was talking about talking to spiritual people, I'm gonna be, uh, say that the stuff we're talking about, percentages and kilograms and things like that, but all the areas we're gonna cover are also spiritual practices. Um, you know, how you get to church, there's a big difference between driving and walking or busing with other people or carpooling. And that's true for the consumption, the energy use, the food. And you can ask us more about it and we'll be glad to discuss it. Uh, also, the last thing is food waste. Um, we're not, I'm not talking about it, but Katrina is here. She has answers, she has a handout, and she has possible pledges on that one. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Okay. Yeah. So back to that no. piece that like what difference does it really make? Like yes. How to make these choices. And I have to say how grateful I am really for this whole initiative. And it's and, and what Sherry said about convenience, because I think this helped me reflect on all the easy choices I make. And I and I'm getting into this, but I really want to see if we can talk practically about the world still producing huge so, Be Becky, because I want to let the other people, I wasn't actually even going to take questions, but I'm glad to take that one. This is, again, this is an area where we have agency. If you're the grocery shopper in your family and you've been doing it for several decades like I have, you will remember that organic produce was not to be found in grocery stores except for the really funky places off to the side. A lot of people decided they wanted to go organic. Voila, you know, your Safeway and Giant have substantial organic sections. Gluten-free, you're seeing the same thing. Go to restaurants. Last two restaurants I've eaten have had vegan offerings. So no, they will not con continue producing beef or clearing Amazonian forest. The American agriculture and the agriculture system gives us what we ask for. 
And so we do have agency in this, and we've seen it. Those of us who've been grocery shopping for a while have seen this very clearly. Um, I know there's other questions, but I want to hand off to the next person. Okay, mindful consumptions next. You want to, Ellie? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm, can you hear me without the mic? The video oh. can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> so I need five hands. Um, okay. So I, my mindful consumption really started when I got tuned into plastic and how plastic is just inundating our environment. Um, I wanted to show you this. I know you're not going to be able to see it very well, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, 1950s. This is a picture from Life magazine. That's when the idea of throwing things away became part of our culture. It wasn't like that before. In fact, um, it was morally repugnant to people to throw things away. Um, so buying and, and throwing away, buying and throwing away is something that started in our lifetimes, started recently. Um, with plastics in particular, in the 1960s, um, the plastics industry realized, well, we can grow a huge business if we make single-use plastics, plastics that you use once, throw away. That's great. The problem is, well, here's a chart of the plastic production over the years, starting in 1960 to today, the way it's increased. Guess what? It accumulates at the same rate. It does not go away. This is the problem with plastic. It's not biodegradable. It just accumulates in our environment. So this is my passion. <laughs> um, so what happens is plastic does break down into small, small, small particles called nanoplastics or microplastics. Um, and that, is, that gets into our food stream, into the water, into our food, um, and into the air we breathe. So the, I, I have um, the same perspective that we do have agency, we can make changes, and it's going to be a hard one because the fuel industry is pushing this stuff on us. And it's our job to push back and say no. So, um, thank you. Um, you'll, you'll notice that there's a lot of legislation out there about plastic bags. They're very visible. It's like low-hanging fruit. And you can see they float around, so they go up to the highest mountain peaks. They are found in the deepest depths of our oceans. Um, it takes about 20 years for this to break down. It doesn't biodegrade, it just goes into smaller particles. Now the thing about plastic is that it's a wonderful material. It's, it's an amazing material. It's so strong and lightweight. So that's why we all, they are easy, we're easily sold on it. It's very convenient. Um, just to a little point about plastic forks take about 500 years to break down, and straws, 200 years, plastic bottles, 450 years. So it's, it's here. All the plastics that's ever produced, about 75% of it is not going anywhere. And the problem is that the plan is to create more and more and more. Okay, so we want to reverse that. I would suggest a good place to start is with plastic bags. Probably almost everyone in this room does a good job of trying to avoid these. Um, I try to avoid them and still they accumulate in my kitchen. I don't know how they get there. <laughs> I, they just come into my life. Um, so, um, I change my habits with plastic bags by um, making sure that my reusable bags, that when I bring the groceries in, I immediately put the reusable bags right with my car keys. They go out with me in the car every morning. I'm sure you all do that too. Um, if I'm in the grocery store and I forgot the bag, I make myself go back and get it. Um, and that helps me change the habit. 
of just relying on the plastic bags. And part of it is just saying no, just saying no to the plastic. No, I don't want a bag, thank you. No, please, I don't need the plastic lid, no straw, all that. I think I'll stop it there. Um, Do you want to talk about them? <clears throat> well, of course. So um, we have different areas. Um, the plastics is the first area. There's also Amazon free Lent. So um, there's a lot of fossil fuel energy going to overnight delivery. Um, all this wonderful convenience. Um, that's a big area that you could decide, well, do I really need that? Being mindful needs versus wants. Um, and um, the clothing, too. Um, a, a, a lot of our clothing is actually made out of plastic. Um, and those little fibers get into our water stream. Um, and so one thing you can do is try to buy fewer clothes, try to buy in a um, uh, secondhand store. And also, I mean, skills of sewing are, I don't, how many people here know how to sew? Wow! <laughs> we should have sewing workshops. Um, so, I mean, yeah, some of those things that just take a lot of time, um, but will bring us back into a more grounded relationship, I think, with ourselves and our environment. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions, Polly? Put our plastics in and it actually is one of the most terrible things that's going on with industry pushing us to consume because China used to buy most of our plastics and maybe recycle some but um, they no longer buy it and most of our plastic goes to third world countries where it is burned and um, which creates incredible air pollution so the idea that you can just recycle your plastic is actually a false, um, uh, is, is not true. And there are federal re regulations that are being pushed to force companies that create plastic to pay to take care of it or to no longer produce as much. It's a really big deal and you see, I, painfully see all these people trying to do the right thing by putting out their recycling. And it's a real trick. We shouldn't fall for it. Thank you. I wanted to just, about plastic bags particularly, those do not go in the Montgomery County recycling. And um, sometimes people will put their plastic recycling in a plastic bag in the container and that messes up their machines. So they don't want the plastic bags. And you can take the plastic bags to different grocery store drop-off centers. You know, what is actually happening to those bags? Um, I know one thing that has been happening is there's a company that makes plastic siding, plastic um, boardwalks, plastic furniture for outdoor um, out of those plastic bags. But um, they also take those big plastic covers for big paper towels amounts and big toilet paper rolls and even Ziploc baggies. Um, all of those things can go in the plastic bag recycling Great. that you drop off, not at Montgomery let, let County. Let me just move to the next one because yeah. I want to make sure we get to transport. So um, I'm going to ask Francis to talk a little bit about transport. So the, the ECHO team is encouraging the congregation to use private cars less during Lent. Um, so please try it because it's good for the climate. But I'm here to tell you from personal experience about how liberating it is not to use your car. I haven't driven a car in four years. Um, and I highly recommend this. Mm -hmm. It's a string backpack, very lightweight. You don't even know you have it on your back when you're walking around. But what it means is if you, if you stop by a grocery store or you have some errands to run, you can pick up something and put it on your back and you don't even notice it most of the time, or at least the weight is very easy. And you have it with you. Also, if it's raining or it's about to rain, you can carry your umbrella here. It leaves your hands free. So I highly recommend this. Um, 
what I want to talk about is the personal benefits. We know it's good for the climate, but I can tell you that it's great on a personal level. I can set off for the day without worrying what time of day it is, what's the traffic going to be like, will I find parking? You don't have to think about that. Uh, as I'm walking, I'm getting exercise without extra time. I know some people will drive to the gym and then work out really like mad for half an hour and then drive back. <laughs> um, also, sometimes I will run into neighbors and it's good for a little social interaction. When we came in here this, this morning, the birds were singing. If you're walking, you can hear the birds. You can see the squirrels chasing each other. You can count rabbits. Um, and these days, you see signs of spring everywhere. The daffodils are, are starting. Snowdrops have been out for several weeks. The mini crocuses are out. Uh, so you can enjoy that. You feel like you're part of nature. Now, there are some, uh, some caveats. Uh, I'm fortunate in that Carl drives. And so when we have uh, heavy groceries or bulky things, we make a run to the grocery store and carry that back in the car. If I, if I couldn't depend on Carl, I would get myself one of these shopping carts that you sometimes see people using. You, can, you see them all the time in New York. You can carry even a watermelon miles in that, in that kind of shopping cart. Um, the other thing is that if you're walking, uh, ladies, your footwear will not be fashionable. It's going to be comfortable walking footwear. But uh, when I used to work, I had shoes in the office that I could wear in the office. And if you're going someplace where you need to look fancy, you can carry them in your string backpack <laughs> and then change them when you have to walk back again. Uh, the other thing is that you do need to pay attention to the weather forecast because lots of people keep an umbrella in their car. If you don't have a car, you need to have an umbrella if you think it's going to rain later on during your day. But you get used to that. Uh, in case people don't know, um, I will be having, uh, passing out handouts of the transit options that are available. Um, the WMATA trip planner, that's the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Agency, whatever, uh, you can go onto that website and plug in where you're starting from, where you want to go, and in general, or you can put in a time of a day and a time of day, and you can get the bus or subway or whatever route connections. And if you have a time of day, it'll even give you a schedule for you know, when, when, to, when to be at wherever you're starting to get to where you want to go by that time. Um, and it covers uh, the subway, metro bus, and ride-on buses. Uh, Montgomery County has a ride-on bus for which the fare is $2. And again, that's on the website there that, that you can pick up. The Bethesda Circulator goes around downtown Bethesda uh, from the Bethesda Metro Station and stops at 20 different places in downtown Bethesda. So uh, certainly if you are coming from outside and parked at the Bethesda Metro, you could then take the Circulator around downtown Bethesda and, and run your errands. And that's free. And then finally, in, in D.C., there's the circulator bus that used to be free and now it costs a dollar. It goes around and it goes, uh, the, the Bethesda free bus is every 15 minutes. The D.C. circulator is every 10 minutes on different routes. And you, will, you can find out the routes uh, on their website. So I encourage you to pick up the handout that gives you the various websites. Or you, if you remember the names of these different, just just Google and it'll come up. And, you know, it's so much easier than, than worrying about where you're going to park your car. If you want to go someplace else and do another errand, are you going to have to move the car, park it someplace else, et cetera? It really is very liberating. I recommend it highly. Thank you, Francis. You're an inspiration to us all. <laughs> um, and then to, just to add, for those of you, um, some of us are also cycle commuters from Bethesda to D.C., and so there's a Washington Area uh, Bike List Association, WABA. Uh, and so I also have uh, great tips for how to keep warm in the cold weather. Uh, Multi-layering, so uh, come talk to me. We can add that if, if you want to move from uh, biking or cars to biking as well, that's another great option. Other question?
<laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah, electric bike is another option. And we've, we're really blessed to have the Crescent Trail, which is traffic-free to get all the way downtown. So that's a, a, a great uh, infrastructure we have here in Bethesda. Okay, so that's transport. I think the final point then is just to bring us all home. Um, so coming back to the point I made at the beginning, we're going to create a community to help all of you uh, if you want to make a pledge. Um, each of these four areas, if you sign up, you will give your, your email, and then we'll create an email group, and we'll start to share resources and tips, and we've already heard a few, um, you know, recipes for vegetarian or bike routes or things like that, uh, tactics, and then also maybe, you know, post a question. I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, you know, ask Tim about motion detector lights, uh, things like that. So we'll create a group. Uh, we'll send regular email uh, updates uh, over the next few weeks. Every week, we're going to focus on a different one of these areas during crossroads. Uh, so I think uh, we'll start maybe next week uh, with transport or, or energy. And then importantly, we're going to come back together after Lent. I think, was it the, uh, the 19th of April? I think we have an, another adult forum. So that, that one, we want to be interactive. We want to hear from you. We want to create a platform to say, well, I tried this. This is great. Here's what you should all do. Or, hey, this is really tough. I found this harder to do than I thought. Um, anybody have any ideas? So we want to create that, that space for a discussion around this. Um, and, you know, frustrations as well as, as successes. So um, each one of the team members um, was listed on the slides. Uh, they're also on the forms outside. And then we're going to be here at the tables around the, the, the room for the next uh, 15 minutes before the, the next uh, service starts. So uh, we can also answer your questions about that. So that's the pleasure of hope. I hope you'll join us. I don't know if there's any final questions uh, before we go to break to the tables. Tim? Uh, I would just put in a plug for walking. I mean, the medical evidence. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so the pledges are at the bottom of the forms. I, here's mine. I ripped it off this morning. So this is the form. There's a form for each of the pledge areas outside. You can just rip off your name and put it in the box outside. There's also an online electronic version. If you want to do it elect electronically, you can just do it there as well. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thanks for coming. We really appreciated your attention. And, and let's, uh, let's do it. Let's uh, have a pledge of hope. <laughs>